I'm just going to give you a quick overview of some of the data that we're finding. Um, so this is potential for rare earth elements in large evaporitic bodies, examples from North American Phanerozoic salt bodies. It's in conjunction with the Ohio Geological Survey um, and also BP, and it's funded by the American Chemical Society and SFA. So here we go. So what exactly are critical minerals? So critical minerals are minerals or elements really that are deemed by USGS as being essential and necessary for our economy. Um, these can be a variety of metals. They can be other resources too, particularly fertilizers or any other thing that really go into our manufacturing process and kind of help us get, they give us the way of life that we're kind of used to. Um, However, they're deemed critical because their supply chain is potentially vulnerable to disruption. Um, we are currently seeing this, not necessarily in um, minerals, but in fossil fuels right now with Russia, right? So there is a potential supply chain disruption for Europe right there. Again, these are a mineral form. Um, really what we're looking for certain elements. Sometimes they come in very specific um, combinations with other elements like lithium, you can get as a lithium oxide or a lithium combined with calcium. Um, and depending on what it is, it's more valuable. It's easier typically to extract and it's for that particular form can just be more easily used. So looking at the critical elements, there's 55 elements that are deemed to be quote unquote critical by USGS. They range from anything from lithium all the way um, through bismuth, um, and these take a variety of different forms. Some of them, I think when we hear them, we're like, oh yeah, that, that's important, we need that. And that we know is rare, so such as lithium, lanthium, cerium, iridium, um, titanium, but some of them we just don't think is being critical, like carbon. That's not technically, it's not really carbon in carbon form, but carbon in graphite form. Um, and a lot of times it's just because we don't necessarily have a homegrown source. So that's part of the problem. Where can we get these here at home? Um, so what exactly are these critical elements used for? Um, right now, the big push is for, um, is for renewable energy, alternative energy, really. And so some examples, this is from a report done by IEA in 2021, focusing on critical elements in renewable resources. And so Copper is an example, and copper is widely used through solar, wind, hydro, et cetera. Going into cobalt, cobalt is extremely valuable for EVs and battery storage. Um, skipping ahead to the rare earth elements, um, we need this for wind. We also need these for battery storage. Um, and then it's also highly used when we're looking at hydrogen storage and hydrogen um, cells also. Um, and again, aluminum, which we can, which is known to be abundant, However, we use this in so many different aspects of all of our alternative energies that it is just, it has a potential supply chain disruption. We don't have enough here in the United States to meet our demand for potential renewable resources. So what else are they used for also? It's more than just renewables. Um, copper and aluminum are also used in all the transmission lines. It doesn't matter where the electricity is coming from. Um, Neudidium is used in magnets. We use it in lights, batteries. We use it for glass polishing, catalysts. Um, scandium is used in TVs and fluorescent lights. Um, what, what, what was the end, uh, new, Neudidium you said? Yeah, it's Neudidium. Um, and then, uh, always. Sorry. And then PMs used in watches and pacemakers also. Um, and then finally, we also use potassium and potash. It's for fertilizer. This is what we need in order to make our, um, sorry, in order to get crops or to create, to grow these crops and essentially sustain our, um, our economy. Sorry, I'm just adjusting my screen a little bit. And so the top three producing countries for select minerals and fossil fuels in 2019, when we start looking at different entities, different quantity, sorry, different, um, different materials, what we notice is that for fossil fuels, the United States does produce quite a lot, right? We were one of the top producing countries. However, when we start looking at some of these others, particularly the metals, we are not typically in the list. Um, a lot of these come from Chile, Indonesia. Um, the main source of cobalt is the Dominican, the Dominican Republic of Congo, um, China, 
um, et cetera. So one thing that we're noticing is that we don't necessarily have homegrown resources. Also, some of these we aren't necessarily always friendly with, is a nice way of putting it, politically speaking, um, or they don't have a stable economy to start with. So sometimes getting those resources can be troublesome. Um, again, looking at some of the supply chain for these select minerals and then compared with the clean technologies that they want to use it for, on the mining and processing side, we see Chile, Australia, we have the DRC, and a lot of China, actually. However, when we start looking at actual use, those where they're being used at is, that, is switching. Um, the EU, US, and China are the main users of these minerals and of these technologies. However, we don't have our own supplies. So once we start looking for these, where are we actually gonna be finding these critical minerals and other rare earth elements? Um, the traditional method is mining. We typically look at hard rocks or these, um, open pit mining, um, and then it's a legion process. There are new options where we're starting to explore looking at shales actually, because a lot of the same processes that are, um, that can concentrate um, organic matter can also, they also tend to concentrate metals. And we know this, as we're starting to explore these shales using chemostratigraphy, XRF, et cetera, what we're finding is that we're finding elevated levels of various metals in there too, such as nickel, molybdenum, copper, et cetera. Um, so that could be another potential option. Uh, brines are another option too. Right now they're exploring lithium in the smack over brine. Um, so when they're producing, they have other people coming in and actually buying these produced waters too. The interesting aspect about lithium is that you don't need a lot to be economical. Um, back in the day, and this is probably like 10, 20 years ago when I was looking at numbers, I think it was around seven PPM if you had a very easy source. Um, now it's maybe a couple hundred PPM tops, um, particularly if you if it's bound to that um, calcium ion. Um, finally, there's also a coal. There's a potential for coal. In 2017, DOE released a port where they were looking at coal and associated um, other lithologies with it, particularly the fire clays. And what they're finding are elevated levels of rare earth elements. And so throughout the Appalachian Basin, they've been exploiting, exploiting, I wouldn't say exploiting, they're exploring options in the coal seams. Um, there we go. They can also find, and they have looked before for critical minerals in seawater too. Um, there's always the thought of potentially mining gold from the ocean, right? However, once we get beyond the chlorine, um, really once we get into some of these, I would say interesting or what we want to actually start looking at um, elements, they're in such low concentrations in seawater, that's always been the problem. They are not economical in order to take the seawater, concentrate it down to get enough um, to precipitate them out. These are in the uh, parts per billion concentrations. However, we know that they're there. Um, so if we can find them in seawater, why don't we take something that's already concentrated in seawater for us? Why, what about evaporites? So would they potentially concentrate in evaporites? Looking at a modern evaporitic system in Sears Lake, California, um, the short answer is yes. <laughs> I'm going to spoil it for you a little bit. The short answer is yes. But so this is a lake in um, Death Valley. It's an endorheic lake. It's arid. It's currently exploited for salt, borax, gypsum. There's a ton of evaporitic minerals in there. Um, it's known for extensive um, evaporites. And its solutes are being sourced from a combination of the Sierra Nevada granitoids. And there's also subsurface hydrothermal springs that are feeding the lake. So when we start looking at these, really what we're finding is that it's not just pure chlorine when we're looking at the salts, um, we're finding other things in there too. So looking at, let me find my mouse. So this right here, these are hopper crystals that came from Sears Lake. They're beautiful. This hand specimen, um, so it's about five inches across. It sits in the palm of my hand. Um, it smells like shrimp brine still. It's that fresh. Uh, so, Right here, so we measured 
we took an XRF gun and we just started measuring, can we find rare earth elements in these and other critical minerals or are these pure salt? So measuring right here is the hopper crystal. We also measured the dark pink ground mass. And then if you would flip this over to the underside of it, there's a light pink ground mass there too. Um, and so we were just measuring, we did a full spectrum of everything that we could do. And so again, what we're finding is chlorine, which we should, uh, we can't measure sodium with our instrument. We also find a little bit, we're finding upwards of maybe about eight, 9% of sulfur in these, um, some enrichment in calc and potassium. But really it starts getting interesting when we look at some of the other trace elements. Um, I'm not sure if the smack over is close enough to the surface to mine. So we have, I'm looking at the chat. So if you guys have questions, feel free to pop them in there. Um, I don't think it outcrops. Correct. My Texas geology is not, I'm an Ohio geologist <laughs> by training. So um, someone else might be better to answer that, but I don't think it's close enough to mine. So I think that's why they're targeting the, um, the brines itself. But I think they are, the lithium is being sourced from the smack over itself potentially. Um, that one I'm not 100% sure. Um, so looking at some of the trace elements in the Sears Lake um, salts, what we're finding is increased levels of vanadium, upwards of 2,500 ppm. We have a little bit of increased levels in titanium in the hopper crystals itself. Um, we get a little bit of uranium. This is actually what's probably, it's the uranium combined with the shrimp actually. Um, is gonna be causing these pink masses in here. And then looking at some of those rare earth elements though, we're actually finding upwards of about 800 ppm of nubidium in them. We have increased levels of prosodinium, um, cerium, lanthium. We aren't finding any scandium and yttrium. However, this is answering the question, are we finding them in modern vaporitic systems? Um, so the answer is yes, yes we are. So, we have them in modern evaporites. We have them in modern seawater. Are there in other evaporitic bodies? Are they in other ancient evaporitic bodies too? So we have a, we used a combination of cores and cuttings from a, across the United States. Um, we have four different sets of samples and these are what we're gonna go through here today. We have the slurry and saline group from Lake County, Ohio. The per, Sorry, I can point up in here. Um, we have the Permian Hutchison salt from Reno County in Kansas. We have the Permian Salado salt from Pecos County in Texas. And then we have Jurassic Luan salt from offshore Gulf of Mexico. We used a handheld XRF. We have a thermal Nikon XL3T Gold Plus. Um, if it was a core, which we only had one full set of core, it was um, the cores were cleaned with DI water and it was the gun was placed directly on the core. Um, if they were cuttings or some of the hand samples, we would crush it, we would clean it, crush it, um, sieve it and pack it into XRF holders. These samples ran for about five minutes and we can get anywhere from magnesium through uranium if we had all the calibrations on here. However, we're just focusing on a lot of the bulk elements. Um, so like chlorine, silicone, if we're in some of these um, silicious bodies, sulfur, um, potentially some potassium and calcium. And then some of those critical in REE, so like the lanthanide series and some of the other metals. Um, we were, did a little bit of XRD just to verify some of the mineralogy and then also SEM to look at some of the crystal structures in there. Um, so we're gonna start with the Permian and Hutchison salt in Kansas. So this is a halite interbedded with gray to black shale. Um, it has bedded gypsum and hydrates throughout. There are conflicting studies on if this is marine versus continental. It's during a time when we are starting to restrict the area. Um, there are freshwater influx, influxes during this time. Um, so it's not 100% sure if this was maybe a lake or if it was, you know, the ocean closing up. The Permian Hutchinson salt has been used for shallow brine pools for wildlife way before humans ever came around. Um, it outcrops near the surface. Well, it would outcrop near the surface if it wasn't dissolved out, but it comes up pretty shallow around here. So this is Kansas and Oklahoma. Um, this gray area is the um, area where we have salt. This is our salt basin here. 
It is currently being mined at the Hutchison Salt Company about 645 feet or 190 meters below the surface. Overall, it's about 99 meters thick, 325 feet. Um, and it's used extensively for road salt across the area. We don't know what that is down here in Texas, but up in Kansas, they do get some, um, they do get a lot of ice storms. So they do need it every now and again, but they also use it for feedstock and they also use it for oil well mud. And so our samples came from Hutchison, I can find my mouse, uh, the Hutchison mine right in here. So these are hand samples. Um, we, looking at these hand samples, what we had were, um, sorry, we had some, some clear right in here. So we try to break off pieces that were pure salt. Um, we also had some with organic matters included in here. And then also we had some with some of this red inclusions in here. <coughs> so looking at these, we have, as expected, mostly chlorine. We have some elevated levels of sulfur. These are probably associated with any of that and hydrates in here. Potassium, which is primarily coming from this red section. So this is sylvite. Um, a little bit of calcium. Um, nutrients thrown in this section for because it's just shown that we don't have any. So looking at some of the trace elements, um, there are actually really elevated le levels of strontium in this, particularly in that red section. So upwards of over 7,000 ppm. Um, and they decrease the cleaner that we get. There are elevated levels of barium and then also magnesium. And a lot of the other ones are pretty, pretty negligible throughout. And then finally, looking at the rare earth elements, what we're finding is that we're upwards of 600 ppm in nudidium. Um, and we then continue to decrease. So we have upwards of 400 ppm in prosodinium, um, about 250 of cerium, um, about 275 lanthium. And then by the time we hit scandium and yttrium, again, we don't really have anything in here. So again, we are finding um, enrichments of these rare earth elements and of other potential critical minerals. So looking at the, per, the Permian Salado Salt in Texas. So during this time, we have withdrawals, withdrawal of the inland seas that covered much of the region during the Pennsylvanian. Um, we have hot, arid, abundant tidal flats throughout. Um, and so we're right in here. We're kind of tra we're transitioning over to essentially pure, pure, um, pure continental eventually. Um, eventually before we even open up and get more inland seas. Uh, so on this point, we're at, so particularly for this section, we are on the central basin platform and we're going into the Delaware basin. Here are two court, two boxes of um, salado core that we have. So these cores are again are cleaned. Um, they're cleaned and then we go through and we do the XRF directly on the base. These are bedded potassium bearing salts and we have a lot of clay inclusions and organic inclusions throughout. As we're crushing them, not only can we see them, but we can also smell the organics and the sulfur coming up. Um, the other interesting part about this one is that we're at meter to centimeter scales of anhydrite, polyhalite, halite, and fine grain siliciclastics. And what it's doing is recording essentially times where we have influx of siliciclastics, influx of fresh water, um, and then dehydrating again. We get this back and forth cyclical nature to here. Um, it could be upwards of 1300 feet and gets about 2500 feet below the surface. So it's not technically that deep. Um, so again, we're here over here in West Texas. So looking at this, we have, we can go down core. Um, we have chlorine, silicone, sulfur, calcium, and magnesium. Our silicon Silicone and calcium is going to represent our siliciclastic component. Um, these are all of our clay inclusions in there. Chlorine is going to be our halite, and sulfur is going to be sulfate in this system. So overall, what we're seeing when we're going down core is exactly what we should. Salt with clay and salt inclusions. Um, looking through here, again, this is a very dirty salt. We do have some sections where it's cleaner. Um, in other boxes, it is more white and it is very pretty clean. However, overall, it's pretty dirty salt. Uh, looking at the trace elements, we are looking at barium, manganese, chromium, strontium, zirconium, and cobalt here. Um, oops, sorry. And so as we're coming through, some of these elements are actually going to be pretty consistent. So if we're looking at magnesium, we are pretty consistent, although we're only at 300 ppm. Um, what we're finding with some of these other ones is that we're having these spikes. And so they're not necessarily always associated with one salt per se, like one, sorry, lithology. So salt or sulfur or something else. But um, there are periods where we have the, some kind of influx. Um, 
And so looking at the REEs, looking at lanthium, prosdenium, cerium, nudidium, scandium, again, as we're coming through, we have pretty consistent levels of all of these throughout. Um, they do fluctuate some, but we're anywhere from, um, so right in here, we're about 400 ppm, all the way upwards of 1,000 ppm in nudidium. Um, these are all correlating pretty well with each other. There are all little discrepancies in there, but really what this is showcasing, this is what's happening in my head at least, is that a lot of these are concentrating, they're precipitating out together. Um, so on average, um, so these are median values. We have about 396 for lanthium, we have 647 for prosodinium, um, 367 for cerium, about that 1009 for nudidium, Scandium is nothing. <laughs> it will be consistently zero throughout. Uh, so looking at the Luan salt, um, the Luan, we, I think we're all very familiar with the Luan. Um, during this time, we have rifting, restricting, and intermittent ponding throughout the area. It's subtropical and arid climate. Um, we have this massive, massive salt body being deposited up over a four kilometers thick. It's mostly halite. However, when you start looking at it, um, it has silty sandy halite intervals and pure impure halite intervals also. So we, um, we were looking at cuttings from an offshore well. And so looking at this section, um, what we're, we can do something very similar as before. We can take the silicone and mag uh, magnesium. That's gonna be our siliciclastic component. Those are gonna represent our clay minerals. Um, Chlorine is going to be halite, sulfur is going to be anhydrite, and then calcium, while we would like it to be purely with the sulfur and the hydrite, um, it actually is a little bit of a complicated story. So looking at the calcium concentrations, um, we do have some correlation with the sulfur, so those are anhydrite components, but we do have um, some carbonates coming in too, and that's where the calcium is going. Uh, we don't really have much of a correlation with silicone. It's not really in the clay minerals. However, it's in some of the other um, evaporites in it and um, carbonates. So we can go through and divide this up by sections. So one aspect of this project, this project is done by Brian Lesh, is that we were actually trying to figure out what is this dirty interval here in this section, right in here. Um, this is from, an, again, it's from an offshore well. It's from the Puma Dia Pier. And one issue that they have a lot of times with these offshore wells are suture zones. So where two salt bodies collide and they have a different lithology. So we were charged with trying to figure out what is in this suture zone. Um, so coming through, what we found is that we have Pliocene Miocene strata at the top of our section. We come through, we have that Luan salt section, mostly salt. However, we do have some impurities coming throughout. Um, and then finally with Miocene section at bottom. Um, but this section right in here, we can identify the suture zone pretty clearly. Um, coming through, and I'm not gonna show cuttings, it is bright red. What it is is quartz, mica, and other clays um, and hematite coating the salt. So it's just allowing some of these, um, it's just, sorry, it's incorporating some of these other sediments in there with it. Um, so looking at seismic, uh, this right here, that green line is our um, Puma well coming through here. This is about the section that we have that we just showed you. And so we can actually, we can start picking up on here, somewhere in here, one of these little reflectors is this zone right in here. So our next step is actually to see if we can correlate some of this geochemistry data with the offshore seismic, and if we can start tracing some of these suture zones out too. Um, okay, so going and looking at some of the critical elements, um, we have barium, magnesium, chromium, strontium, zirconium, and cobalt. Uh, looking down section, we can, sorry, we can then differentiate all these again by the sections, pliocene, miocene, luian salt, and miocene. Um, looking at the barium, chromium, these are probably contamination. These are probably contaminations from the drilling bit and also the drilling fluids. Um, sorry, the zirconia, uh, is probably oftentimes these are associated um, with the clay minerals. Um, so with the siliciclastic component, it correlates very well with that. Same with the strontium. Um, the cobalt, on the other hand, I am still trying to work out, not gonna lie. So looking at the REEs down section, we can again start differentiating between our different sections, our siliciclastic components compared with our um, compared with our salt sections. And what we're finding is that. In the salt section, 
even compared to our overlying and underlying strata, we're having enrichments of these rare earth elements. Um, we are upwards of um, about 200 ppm with the new didium for a median value. And we get, again, scandium is just absolutely non-existent. It has a couple spikes in some of the other in the overlying and underlying strata. Um, however, we do have enrichments compared to the overlying and underlying strata of lanthium, prosodidium, cerium, and nudidium. Again, our REEs are correlating pretty well. So that's signifying that they're enriching together. Um, and again, no scandium in the salts. So finally, our last section is the slurry and salina group. Um, this section was deposited in Sabka to Salina to subsea conditions. Um, this is at the time, so this is in the Appalachian Basin. We have opening and closing of the basin. Sometimes we have connections with the Michigan Basin up in here. So right in here is the Appalachian Basin. Up in here is the Michigan Basin. Um, so what we have is this extensive evaporitic body deposited throughout. It is not as extensive as the Luan. In fact, it's very different than the Luan. Um, really, it's a cyclical between various evaporitic sequences, silisticlastics. Um, and so the thickest primary salt bed is probably about 140, 150 feet thick, at least in Ohio. So going through, um, when we start looking at the Salina group, it is multiple salt beds and are bedded with dolostone and hydrite shale and siltstone. It's very cyclical in deposition. Overall, it's about 1.5 million years of deposition throughout the section. Um, and so this is a well log. It's differentiated from the A through the G, depending on which section you're in. Um, and anything that's colored, these are actually salt bodies that have been identified in here. And so unlike the Luan, it has it has individual beds that can be traced actually over fairly, fairly far distances, at least throughout Eastern Ohio. So our thickest bed is usually one of the F beds up in here. So a lot of these are more like stringers coming through. Um, so this project was actually in conjunction with the Ohio Geo Survey and had, again, different goals. So this one, the goals of this were core and mapping studies to determine extent geochemistry and tectonic influence of the area. Um, the Appalachian Basin is a very um, classic foreland basin. Um, and it's just, it's been widely studied. There's been tons of, there's been, sorry, four overall tectonic events. And now we're trying to figure out how far do some of those tectonic influences go? Do they actually go all the way throughout Ohio? And the answer is yes, they do. So they must be affecting this section too. Um, we're evaluating depositional environment. It was originally thought to be deep water, like the Luan. However, now we're thinking it's more shallow, either shallow all the way through, um, tidal mud flat section. And then we needed to reassess the actual volume of the salt. So this is widely used for table salt. So Morton actually extracts down here in Wayne County. Um, there's a subsurface mine here in Ohio or underneath the lake. Um, it's about, it's uh, about 1800 feet below the surface and about five miles out beneath the lake that's been operating since the 1940s. Um, and so we used a combination of core, and then mapping, which we're not gonna go through the mapping today. We're just gonna stick to the core and the, um, and the elemental data. So looking at the core, um, this was halite, obviously. And so there are multiple types of halite throughout this. This is generally coarsely crystalline. We have organic inclusions throughout of this one too. Um, so we can see it, oh, sorry. We can see it down in here. That's what this black section actually is in here. Um, it ranges in color from clear to yellow. We get this reddish pink coming in here um, all the way to dark gray. Um, throughout, we have these dendritic shales that were deposited. Uh, well, at the time of deposition, they were incorporated. And then we oftentimes see beds and fracture fills. So they're coming up through um, and then also filling throughout. Looking at this in SEM, um, it can actually give us an idea as to potential primary, secondary um, crystal structures in here. So this could potentially be, and we're still debating on this, chevron patterns. You can kind of see right in here. So you can see the salt crystals coming through and it kind of looks, you can just see it going back. Um, here though, what we're finding is what they call mosaic pattern. And there's salt being precipitated out in pores. Um, so 
if this is a true chevron pattern, this is actually um, what is thought to be a primary uh, crystal structure in here and that it hasn't undergone dissolutionary precipitation. Whereas this is actually telling us a very different story and that this has undergone dissolutionary precipitation. Oh, right in here, beautiful salt crystals right in here in the SEM. Um, overall though, what we're seeing and this is what at least some of the samples and a lot of the samples actually suggest is that we do have dissolution reprecipitation. In other words, we have potential remobilization of these elements. So it's not just as simple as we have salt water during time of deposition from the sea. So let's you know concentrate it and precipitate it out. Um, there are multiple potential basin flushing events that could then um, affect some of these too. So another way we can tell we have reprecipitation or recrystallization. So this is in the mine underneath Lake Erie. And so we have this really sugary texture right in here. Um, and these are little, um, these are folds in the anhydrite beds. These dark layers are anhydrites, the whites are the salts. And so this is suggesting not only do we have movement of this salt body, it's not as, again, masses of the Luan. And I keep referring back to the Luan because um, we are here in Texas and that's what a lot of people are familiar of. Because you need, Oh, I'm sure somebody else would know this better than me. I forget how many, the thickness of salt that you need for it to really mobilize, but we just don't have that. Um, the, again, the thickest bed of salt is usually about 140, 150 feet thick in here. And so you usually don't get that movement, large scale movement, halokinesis, but we do have small scale movements as shown in here, these little recumbent folds. This right in here is reprecipitation um, of this salt body. So continuing on, again, we have dolostone in here. They're buff to gray. We have anhydrite growth coming in. So suggesting that we're in a shallow or shallow um, tidal Sabka Salina setting. Um, we have algal laminations and these algal laminations are actually mud stained. Oh, sorry, right in there, oil stain. That's what this all this is. Um, again, we have mud cracks coming up through here. Um, and so a lot of this is just pointing towards Salina Sabka settings. Looking through, we have, uh, again, we have anhydrite growth coming in here. Um, we have pyrite inclusions on the center of these anhydrite growths right in here. And then also we have partial dolatomization. Um, and looking at those anhydrite growths, if we were to look at them in a core, they're gonna look like this on a larger scale. So this is dolostone with the black as being an anhydrite coming through in here. So overall, what we're seeing throughout all of these is that we have this cyclical pattern deposition. And so what we have is evaporation less a classic influx, this constant back and forth. Um, we have, a, overall, we have a shallow basin setting when a salina is a sopra. We're not really in this deep basin setting. Um, and then we also, we have multiple flushing events. And so what we're seeing is dissolution and reprecipitation of these two. So it's not just as simple as like, okay, let's precipitate it and figure out what's going on. There's multiple factors that are coming in here. But overall, and one important aspect of this one is that we are very different than some of the previous salt bodies too. So we're getting a good co comparison. So again, we can go through and do the same thing. Looking at the elemental data, we can use this to figure out our main mineralogy of bases. Our siliciclastic component is represented by silicone. Chlorine is representing our halite. Um, so here, our sulfur and calcium is going to be in hydrite. And then our magnesium is our duller stone. Every now and again, we'll get a partially doltematized section. And that's where our calcium can spike up a little bit more than what it should overall calcium is going to be with our sulfur. And so we can divide these into all those A through G section. Really, we have B through the overlying bass islands in this section, um, but we can start seeing all of our different bases coming through. And so this can give us a visualization on are we concentrating some of these in very specific bases or are they just kind of all over the place? So looking at some of our trace elements, um, barium, magnesium, chromium, strontium, zirconium, and cobalt, really what we're finding is that we have increased levels throughout. Um, when we start looking at how they are correlating with different lithologies, there's not necessarily one specific lithology that we're finding in here. Um, really when we're looking at strontium, 
what we're finding is that strontium is highly correlating with the sulfur. Um, this is replacement creating celestite. Um, our zirconia is correlating again with our silicone, um, with our silicoclastic component. Uh, it's associated with the shales. And then some of the other critical elements, we are finding some levels in the chlorine and the halite, um, sorry, associated with the chlorine, so in the halite. However, some of these, um, such as the strontium um, or the titanium, they are more concentrated in the other, other faces, either in the shales or in the anhydrites, or the mat, or sorry, there's also dolostones in there. So looking at the REEs, we can then do the same thing. We have, we are variable down core. Um, looking at the different lithologies, what we're seeing is that, again, they're not necessarily correlating with just the halite, which is what I thought when I was going into this project. That was my preconceived notion is that we're going to be finding a ton of these elements in the halite bodies. Really what we're finding is that they're kind of all over the place. Um, and so looking at the chlorine, looking at REEs, again, we have increased levels here. We can get upwards of about 650 um, ppm in nudidium. However, we can get upwards of 1300 ppm of nudidium in the other bodies. So they are concentrating elsewhere. Um, really what they're concentrating, they're more, they're more concentrated actually in the anhydrites in this section than the salts. Um, so overall, what we find is there is abundance in the halite, but again, we're finding them in the other bodies too. Um, looking at average, or sorry, medians, um, the lanthium is about 183, prosodinium is about 288, um, cerium is at 161 ppm, um, our nudidium is upwards of 428. And again, when we're just looking at those salt bodies, in the scandium, we don't have any. <laughs> Sometimes we can get upwards of 19, but really we're finding out, we can find scandium in other lithologies, but not in the salt bodies. Um, so overall, okay. Um, overall, what we're finding is that there are variations in bulk and trace elements in these salt bodies. Um, they're at similar concentrations as hard rocks we mine. And I'm gonna show you that, those numbers here in a minute. Um, what we're finding, so if we start looking through, um, we have increased, so looking at the bulk, um, obviously we have off the chart chlorine because we should, um, but we have increased levels of sulfur representing that in hydrate component into all, pretty much most of these systems. Um, we do have varying levels of, cal of sorry, potassium represented. Typically it's gonna be our sylvite component. Um, and then calcium kind of varies also. Um, looking at some of the critical elements, these are highly variable. Um, these are, this is very dependent on the body that we're in, but we can have um, the vanadium, titanium, and some of these can be um, quite enriched, whereas the other ones are just not present at all. Um, but finally, looking at the rare earth elements, what we're finding are actually similar um, overall enrichment factors, they follow very similar patterns, but we can have over a hundred or a thousand PPM in nudinium, so in the solato, um, all the way down to almost non-existent in scandium and yttrium. However, what we're finding is that we do have enrichments of these rare earth elements in these salts. Um, the variability of these is going to be due to dissolution, um, heating events, so we just have different basin histories for each one of these. Um, they're gonna have different sources. So the Luan was trying to figure out where some of the solutes are being sourced from. It could potentially be carbonatites. It could be the highlands right offshore. Um, with the Salina, it's probably gonna be the Appalachians right there and that freshly um, accreted arc right there. Uh, even still with the um, Salado and the Hutchison, those could have potentially more terrestrial sources from those mudflats. Um, there could also be potential for subsurface influxes in there too. Um, all right, so looking at hard rocks versus evaporites, um, the numbers are comparable, in my opinion. They're not the same, but they are comparable. So ARE is American Rare Earths. Um, in Wyoming, they have the Hollow Creek Project, 
So Halleck Creek project area. Um, they're looking at the Overton Mountain is another mountain in the area. And so they are targeting hard rocks in the area with approximately 2300 to 29 ppm of total rare earth oxides. Um, so that's beyond just what we're looking at here. And so looking through their 2018 sampling program averages for their oxides, um, they range from anywhere between five, four, or sorry, 12, 1,227, all the way down to 128 ppm. Um, the averages in our salt bodies that we're finding here, and again, these aren't the oxides, but um, we're still on similar orders of magnitude. And so we're between 185 per the cerium, all the way upwards of 495 for the eudidium. If you target specific bodies, so like the Salado, that has upwards of 1,000 ppm on average. So overall, what we're finding are similar ranges, similar um, concentrate, sorry, similar magnitudes, there we go, um, of these rare earth elements in these salt bodies. However, one thing that's going to change, one that could potentially make these honestly a viable source in my my mind at least is how we extract them um looking at so hard work mining is typically strip mining um and then they have to go through the leaching process we can dissolve these out that is one beauty about the salts um, i know that the anhydrites you can dissolve out some of the anhydrites too but the salts are just more readily dissolvable and we already do it anyway so during this process, what we do is pump pressurized water down a hole and we start dissolving it out. We create a concentrated brine and then we pump it up to the surface. Typically when we're doing this, we are either using this for a salt product. So salt, table salt is oftentimes done like this, or um, we want the cavern for storage, either NGL storage, we're in this race right now for hydrogen storage in order to utilize hydrogen for alternative energies um, or waste just for um, nuclear waste. And so rather than just taking that brine and trashing it, essentially pumping it into somewhere else, paying for it to be disposed of, we can then take it um, and concentrate it down. Um, and one potential option is actually concentration via solar. They already do this in the Dead Sea. And so what they do, they have holding ponds where they have, um, they start precipitating out, they concentrate it down, they get a certain, they get a certain um, mineral in a certain pond, they move the water over, they get the next element out and they just continuously concentrate it down. Um, we can, if we can pinpoint where in this evaporitic series we are getting concentrations and enrichment of these rare earth elements or a particular element maybe of sort, um, we could then figure out our series of ponds, I keep losing my mouse, I'm sorry, um, and figure out where we can then concentrate these down. Um, salt water or seawater, um, when it's starting to precipitate down, we have a very known series of precipitations. It's usually calcite and aragonite first, then we get gypsum, then we start getting halite, and eventually we start getting all the bitter insults, just depending on what the, con the elemental um, concentrations are in the seawater. So um, overall, I just want to thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, thanks to all these lovely people. And so do I have any questions? I do want to say Thank you for your presentation. And um, so I'm, I'm kind of wondering the, the picture that you had with the, the characters that, that anhydrite, it reminds me of the Castile formation in the Permian Basin. It's the one with the, you know, have you ever seen that? Um, I've not seen it, but I've been told I need to go see it. <laughs> So what I was wondering, so how do you, how does how do you get to work on this project? So is this something that you solicit or is this something that's you apply for or they seek you out? Um so are you talking about how did I specifically do this or how does somebody help in well, the, the Stephen F. Austin and then you're and then uh, you're on the project? So yeah, so um when I was at the Ohio Geo survey, my thought was so I wanted 
a handheld XRF because I'm a nerd and I really like shales. So I want to start studying them and start doing all this stuff. And I needed to start finding other ways too, in order for the, you know, the state to buy it. And we were looking at the Salina group to redo a study that was done in 73 and it hasn't been looked at since. So I'm like, we should do trace elements in it too, because we are digesting this and we're putting it on the roads. And so what else is in it? Like what could, from an environmental standpoint, like what else is in this? Could we be putting arsenic on the roads and we just don't know it. Mm-hmm. And so that's actually what started all of this. And then um, I've been talking to a couple of people up there who are looking at the Salina group for storage and they're finding REEs and a whole bunch of other interesting things. They're finding lithium. We can't do lithium, but there's a lot of lithium in these salts too. And so um, it's just kind of spiral out of control. So when I was, before I left the survey, I started a sampling program on one of the cores. And so I have those cores here with me in SFA. Um, we, at SFA, we have the core repository. So we also have the Salado core. Um, we have Hutchison hand samples. So it's just literally material that we have. Oh, awesome. great. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, okay. So looking at this picture is, is this, uh, it almost looks like a cave the way you have it portrayed here, of course, with these characters, but mm-hmm. um, it's a mine. Is it a small sample or is it, oh, it is a mine. Okay. The mine. Yeah. So it's about, um, it's about 40 feet in height. Um, they've been mining this section for since the 1940s. Um, and so these are, um, we got the chance to go under in the mine to go check it out. Um, So this is one of the salt walls where they were, um, they, they weren't setting charges on this one, but they're setting charges like kind of nearby. So they let us come up and check it out. Oh, nice. Yeah. So it's a subsurface mine. They're actively mining. So. um, Okay. So there are, let's see, there's a couple things going on in the chat here. So one of them is, if the Salado was at the surface and mineable, would it be economic, economic for REEs? Um, I ask that question a lot too. And so I would say, I don't even think it needs to be at the surface. I think you can do dissolution mining very easily and low cost, um, particularly with the fact that you're in West Texas and you have that awesome sun already beating down. Um, you can probably concentrate it pretty easily, actually. You just need some space. Um, so uh, I would say yes. I don't know the economics because then you also have to get it to market. So there's always a lot of variables that go into it. Um, I am a geologist by training and not an economist. So I can only give you so much information on that. Uh, and then there's also the chain, like I said earlier, lithium. I would, that's our next step actually is going for lithium. That's what my grad student's gonna be doing on the Luan is seeing how much lithium's in that section. Um, Okay, the Salina mine looks like the Katie Hockley mine near Katie, Texas. That's why I've been told um, that I haven't been in that mine. A lot of the mines get shut down. So the only reason why I was able to go in this mine was because I was with the state government. <laughs> and wow. so we got access to go. Um, oh, and there's actually a, a mine in Katie. Huh. I had yeah. no idea. Yeah, it's just north of Katie. And, uh, and it actually has some pretty thick walls without any, you know, where it's just massive salt halite. Oh. But it's also kind of cool because you're, they take the equipment apart to take it into the mine. They have to take the equipment apart and, uh, and then assemble it in the mine. And it stays oh. in the mine. Okay. That's um, what this one's like. It's like its own little city down there and nothing ever sees the sunlight again. Oh, wow. Some of the supports in the mine are uh, crumpled. You know, they put like they'd carve a little room and they would put so, uh, like a metal frame around the doorway. And after a few years, the salt moved and would crumple that uh, metal frame. Oh, wow. <laughs> it also- so have you actually, you've been in that, in the Katy mine or the one near Katy? Yes, uh, but it was before they closed it to geologists. I mean, uh, uh, I think it was 1996 or seven when I went in the mine. It was a geology field trip for uh, an oil company. Oh, fun. 
Yes, somebody else said here, Hockley is still active, but no visitors allowed. And if you want any samples, they give me some to distribute to outreach and the HGS members, huh? That would be awesome. <laughs> so Julie could get some samples. Mm -hmm. I think Our also Freeport McMoran uh, mines salt offshore, Gulf of Mexico. Oh, that would be interesting. Uh, you know, with, they do it the way you were saying, they pump water down and mm -hmm. uh, dissolve the salt. So you might be able to talk to them and get samples mm. if you're interested. I need to write some of this stuff down here. Sorry. And she and so she actually Janet actually left her her email here. Julie, do you see I'm that? I'm gonna write it down. Okay. Um, oh, that is not it. Come back here. Okay. So does does anybody, um, well, do, is there anyone else who has any questions for Julie? Y'all are all so quiet tonight. Thank you, Julie. That was really interesting. I hadn't thought about rare earth elements in uh, brines. Yeah. Um, it was, it's been a kind of crazy ride. And um, when you start talking to people and you stop and think about it, it's like, that makes perfect sense though that they're in there right it's like just it's coming from um i mean we use rare earth elements to differentiate different meg metamorphic and igneous bodies to see where they're coming from right they're in these hard rocks and we know that so it's like okay as we are then essentially weathering them and eroding them they have to go somewhere they're not just you know so they're just concentrating in the seawater as it is um i'm trying to work out some of the actual like, mechanisms and link all the core to how these are getting there and where they're, you know, we haven't quite figured that out for all of them. I think each one has this unique story. Um, and so that's kind of where our next steps are going is teasing all the actual geology out of it, not just here, here's a bunch of data, but. Um, yeah, I suppose lithophases and the the original sources of the minerals in the seawater would mm -hmm. make a big difference as, you know, what each salt body has. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And the overall averages vary from body to body. I mean, they're there, but they do. They so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, Lindell says we have looked at data from 144,000 oil and gas swells in the U.S. and Canada exploring for lithium and other elements. It's amazing how much is out there. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, yeah, so there's a site in Ohio that they're doing storage and geo storage um, in a dissolution cavern. Um, and they're also looking at the coal seams and they are just getting so much lithium out of these sections um, that combined with like just brines. I mean, we're throwing it away anyway. That's my other thought. So a lot of this we're just throwing away. So why can't we try to be, you know, user friendly, I guess, stop being so wasteful. All right. Anyone else have any questions? Oh, it looks like there's a couple more comments. Let's see. Have you considered the evaporating tailing ponds for mining in the West? That would be interesting. Um, no, I haven't. So I would, I'm wondering about some of the environmental concerns with some of those too. So um, I'm just thinking of how acidic they are, but I have, no, that would be interesting to look at also. I bet you there's a lot in there. Um, one of the things that we're we need to figure out is that are some of these so some of these are cores some of these are um cuttings some of these are hand samples from mines and we are finding concentrations in all of these but are some of them coming from like the drilling fluids um some of them don't have drilling fluids so those ones are clearly no so some of them we just need to make sure that we're covering all the bases in those so like on the Louie and cutting samples um we need to just 
cover that too and make sure. But a lot of the materials that they're using in these industrial practices, I bet, have a lot. <laughs> Not necessarily on purpose, but um, yeah. Okay. So I don't see any more questions. Any, any last questions or does anyone have any announcements? We are winding down for the summer. Um, we just had elections. I don't know if anyone knows the results of those elections. I do not. And we have our renewal coming up here in June. And uh, there is a well, well log course. It's beyond basics coming up at the uh, beginning of June, June 10th. And I, and so did anyone actually go to the, the shrimp peel and crawfish boil by any chance? I'm curious to know how that went. Nobody's speaking up, so maybe not. Oops. Janet says it was delicious. <laughs> oh, there's, so there's a comment, yeah. <laughs> 